Okay, we are live. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the second part of the Astro 2022 workshop. So this session dedicated to the methodology of science. So we have the second invited speakers of today, Melissa Jaycart. Uh, she's an assistant professor in philosophy department at the University of Cincinnati. And she's also associate director of the, for the University of Cincinnati, the Center for Public en Engagement with Science. Uh, her current research focuses on the epistemological issues in the philosophy of science. In particular, she's engaged uh, using her models and computer simulations in astrophysics. Uh, she's also very engaged uh, in public and science education and public understanding of science. Uh, she had previously a postdoctoral research in, uh, in the philosophy department at the University of Pennsylvania and the Carnegie Observatories. And then before that, she obtained, of course, a PhD in philosophy at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. So welcome, Melissa. Very, thank you a lot for joining us. And uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, I will show you three minutes before the end of your talk. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for having me. So before I start my talk, I want to introduce myself a little bit more as a philosopher of science, because for some of you, uh, you may have heard talks by philosophers before, but for others of you, uh, today might be the first set of talks you're hearing from philosophers of science. So I want to start by introducing what I do as a philosopher of science and specifically astrophysics. So essentially, my research attempts to understand and assess the use of models and computer simulations in science, and particularly their role in astrophysical methodology. Uh, namely, I think there are really interesting challenges astrophysicists face in being able to generate reliable inferences from the use of models and computer simulations in their field of study. Uh, so I'm interested in understanding how scientists construct models uh, and computer simulations and assessing what it means to say a specific model or computer simulation is good or successful, uh, and then how such claims are evaluated by that scientific community, and how astrophysicists then generate reliable inferences about the objects of study uh, from, from these tools. And so that's really gonna be the focus of my talk today. I'm gonna to start out by sketching some of what I think are the interesting methodological challenges that are faced by astrophysics um, and astrophysicists specifically connected to the use of models and computer simulations in the science. Uh, the rest of the talk will focus on discussing how astrophysicists go about addressing these challenges. Um, and to facilitate this, I'm going to look at a particular case study I'm very familiar with, uh, that's the case of simulating ring galaxies. Uh, I'll then go on to discuss three roles I see computer simulations playing in being able to generate reliable inferences. Uh, namely, I think they're being used to uh, test hypotheses, constrain parame uh, po uh, parameter space, but mostly amplifying uh, astronomical observations. So that's going to be my plan for today. Now, there are many ways that scientists investigate the world. Uh, some scientists conduct experiments, but some sciences like uh, astrophysics, where you're studying the universe, it's really hard or in some cases impossible to do experiments. And so in these cases, we often turn to models and computer simulations. That there are also challenges faced in trying to understand how one can generate knowledge from models and computer simulations. So models, and simulations by their very nature are not perfect replications of the world uh, and they are incomplete representations and only in some ways partial descriptions of the features of the world that they're actually trying to investigate and model. Uh, and so in the process of building models and computer simulations, certain idealizations and approximations are made. So here's an example of a whole host of kind of astronomical uh, uh, models and computer simulations um, about large scale structure 
cluster and individual galaxies. And so in building these models and uh, computer simulations that might be targeted at modeling the structure of the universe, some features of the target system of study are necessarily left out. Um, so for an example, those in the left column here have only included dark matter and have excluded all baryonic matter. Uh, and, none of, um, and in none of these uh, simulations is every aspect of every galaxy or every part of the system actually uh, incorporated and contained in the model or the computer simulation. So in all of these cases, idealizations and approximations by the simulators have been made. But despite these simulations not including all the features of the target system, astrophysicists think these models can help understand the varying galactic or large scale structures. And so on some measures, uh, astrophysicists are really quite pleased with simulations that they generate. This is a really nice example of what's often considered a really good simulation uh, when compared to the observational data. Um, the simulation here being the large scale structure and the observations are quite accurate and very similar to what's actually seen in the observational evidence. Um, and so this one might be assessed as a good or successful simulation. Uh, but here is another example of a space that sometimes is, in, is assessed as not being quite as successful. Uh, here on the left is an example of what a computer simulation predicts our local area of the universe to look like uh, in a Lambda CDM universe. Uh, wherever you see a dot, essentially, there should be a galaxy with dark matter there. Uh, and on the right, however, is all the galaxies based on observations that we actually see um, in our local space. Uh, and as you can see, there's quite a lot less. Uh, so thus far, astrophysicists have only been able to account for a fraction of the dark matter that's supposed to exist in the universe. Um, and these kinds of simulations have led to one of the big questions, uh, where is the rest of this predicted dark matter in the universe? Uh, where are all these missing satellites? Um, and so these questions in astrophysicists or in astrophysics have emerged, I think, from this relationship between observations and simulations. Now, I want to take a minute to highlight why, as a philosopher, I think trying to get a better understanding of the relationship between uh, observ observation and simulation is so important and particularly in the context of astrophysics, uh, which is why I, I ask questions about it. And I think this is due to one of the fundamental methodological challenges uh, that we're up against in, ast uh, in astronomy. So by its very nature, astronomers, as I said, can't perform experiments on say stars and galaxies. Um, in any sort of actual material way, the same way, say, a biologist might be able to experiment on actual um, mice or something like that. There isn't anything to interact with directly, so astrophysicists can't, for example, take two galaxies and just smash them together, um, and, or take a real galaxy and sort of see how it evolves over time. Astrophysicists can only observe what's already happened. So that is to say it faces an observation-based epistemic challenge. Um, in some sense, the subjects themselves cannot be uh, manipulated experimentally. Um, and there's also in astronomy issues connected to sparseness of data. Uh, in some cases, you only have one observational snapshot of the target system under investigation. And while we can obtain and study a variety of data about a single object along a whole electromagnetic spectrum, uh, we don't have access to watching those same systems evolve over time. And so often how astrophysicists have been able to get around this is by bringing in computer simulations to try and allow us to better understand these systems. Uh, in the case of where there is little or no uh, direct access, um, incorporation of what one does have direct access to say these observational snapshots, it's really critical. Um, and so to, un to understand how observations and computer simulations work together um, as evidence for claims becomes increasingly important for those claims that uh, then want to be uh, justified. Now, 
In the context of the philosophy of science literature, uh, there has been a, uh, an extensive debate regarding the epistemic status of computer simulations. Uh, some philosophers have argued for what's called a materiality thesis, uh, in which a material object target correspondence is the defining feature for things like experiments. Um, and this correspondence is ultimately responsible for what they call as a simulator's or a experimenter's advantage. Uh, they, their suspicion or conviction um, is that experimenters simply have more direct access uh, to the target system than the simulationist does. And as such, computer uh, simulations will always be epistemically inferior to uh, experiments, to real experiments. Now, on the other side of things, uh, some philosophers have refuted this and have argued that this sort of material correspondence is not and should not be thought of as necessarily the best route to valid scientific inferences. Um, and in connecting this to the case of astrophysics, in some ways, there's really no way to ever physically interact or manipulate with these physical systems that are being investigated. Um, in this sense, the traditional experiments that that are thought to be of higher status just simply aren't possible. Uh, so simulations are really in some ways the only ways or means to investigate the system of interest and to gain knowledge of the target system. So given these methodological challenges faced by astrophysics, part of my approach to trying to understand what's going on is in astrophysics is trying to view this conflict between experiment and simulation almost as a false dichotomy. So rather than showing how computer simulations in astrophysics do or don't meet epistemic standards philosophers have prescribed in this debate, um, or trying to determine computer simulations, in this case, actually do count as experiments. Part of what I'm choosing to do uh, is look at how uh, computer simulations are actually being used in investigations to try and figure out how the outputs actually obtain their epistemic status in the field of astrophysics and how that might be characterized. Um, and so what I think is needed is a better understanding of this observation and simulation relationship. So as a philosopher who uh, tries to analyze these kinds of questions, um, I'm really interested in things like the fact that for a lot of astrophysics, these claims are tied to this relationship between observation and theory and computer simulation. So I'm really interested in understanding what this relationship is about, understanding under what conditions a indirect observations in modeling and simulation should be convinced as convincing as direct observation, under what grounds the sort of viability of simulations to characterize morphology and confirm dynamics of the real world systems. And then ultimately, uh, we can't always do deduction. So how do astrophysicists ground inferential powers of these simulations to these various cases? Um, so these are the questions I'm interested in answering as a philosopher of physics uh, and a philosopher of astrophysics. Uh, and so now let me tell you how I approach answering these kinds of questions. So I consider myself to be doing uh, what's called embedded philosophy of science. So that is, I am doing both the science and the philosophy. Um, I'm working closely with and am a member of the community that is the subject of my philosophical work. Um, so I work with a research team that is interdisciplinary. It's made up of astrophysicists and philosophers. Um, and we're currently doing work related to ring galaxies. Um, this is the object that I'll talk a little bit more about in the rest of this talk today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit first on the science side of things, and then I'll provide you a little bit of philosophical analysis about how computer simulations are being used in our project um, and tie back to those questions I just posed. Okay. So now recall I mentioned that in astrophysics, uh, there's a sense in which some, in some ways you're tied to these snapshots. Um, so here are some examples of these, just standard pictures of what uh, galaxies look like, spiral or elliptical galaxies. 
Uh, here are some more snapshots. These galaxy structures are uh, ring galaxies, what I study. Um, and it's the object that we work on. And it turns out this shape is uh, rather rare as far as galaxy shapes go. Uh, these shapes are not natural in any kind of way that spiral or elliptical galaxies are. Um, these are collisional ring galaxies. And they get their ring shape only when a galaxy undergoes a near head-on collision with another galaxy of just the right mass. Now, from observations, astronomers have identified a set of key defining properties that all these collisional ring galaxies have. Uh, they're always narrow. They always have a blue or young stellar population. They're always rotating in a very particular way. They're always expanding in a particular way. Uh, they always have the collisional companion along the minor axis and typically an off-center nucleus. And these observations are what are then used to guide building and evaluation of various galaxy collision simulations. Now, astronomers have known about ring galaxies for some time. Uh, as far back as 1976, they were able to use computer simulations as a tool to understand how these rings got their shape. Uh, so for these early simulations, there wasn't any need to capture the exact trajectory of every particle. Um, they simply wanted to provide general how possibly accounts for how these galaxies might have gotten their shape. The two masses of the galaxy were varied as a means of exploring how the two galaxies might interact, um, and as well as under what conditions are necessary for these rings to obtain a certain shape. Um, so here we have a disk galaxy and its collider companion showing how these ring galaxies are formed. And so here is going to be another simulation of what these ring galaxy collisions look like. Um, this is going to be a collision between an elliptical and a spiral galaxy to form a ring galaxy. So on the left is uh, the snapshot image, the actual telescope observation. Um, and on the right here is a point particle simula uh, based simulation. And so what you're gonna see is the galaxy being hit by the elliptical galaxy, um, which is currently off screen, but you'll see it in a moment. So let me start this. So the galaxy is rotating and here comes the collider. It goes through, creates a near identical uh, simulation to the image. And then after a few rotations, it dissipates and merges together. Okay. Here is another example um, from those working with the, uh, the research group I work with based on, um, again, some op uh, observations and building the simulations um, to figure out what these collisions look like. On the left is the optical image. The middle is the spectroscopic data, uh, which gives us our velocity field. And then this information becomes the basis for a simulation. Uh, the image on the right is a simulation of the galaxy um, collision informed by or constructed with the data we know about the galaxy from observation, namely its general composition, its mass. Okay, so that's a little on the observation side. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about how these simulations are actually being created. Um, so my research group in particular is using um, the gizmo code. So this code houses all of that background theory, a lot more background knowledge. Um, it includes components of the universe, which we're taking to be Lambda CDM uh, understanding of the universe. And it allows for flexibility in terms of input of initial conditions, um, again, taking ours from CMB. And this helps us constrain the possibility space of configurations that particles in simulations can take. Um, there's also laws of physics, particularly that gravity is driving structure formation. But most importantly, in contrast to previous astronomical uh, simulations, such as that point particle ones I was just showing you, Gizmo is one of the first codes to really prioritize and leave space for the inclusion of fluid dynamics and star formation and feedback as a critical part. So prior simulations typically left out or idealized these features um, uh, as not being uh, uh, because they weren't essential. However, these new simulations are trying to put those features um, or incorporate them back in and include them because in the case of single individual galaxies, um, their development and evolution over time really requires these kinds of things to be uh, in the simulations. 
So by including feedback in these realistic environments, simulators hope to be able to increase the predictive power of the galaxy formation simulations without any of this fine tuning, um, which is rather critical in these cases of these individual galaxies. Uh, some of these simulator slogans is essentially don't trust models that don't do stars or interstellar medium, uh, right, because they're such critical drivers of single galaxy formation. Um, and so this is part of our motivation for this as well. So again, when building simulations, uh, they, it's looking, it's a matter of looking at individual galaxies that are undergo a collision. And in trying to construct those galaxies, there are a number of parameters needed for those simulations. Um, so these are just a variety of the observation-based inputs that drive these kinds of simulations. Uh, and then these are also all the ways in which we change our parameters in our simulation and exploring what impact that might have on the collision. Um, and so one of the other things that I think is really fun about this is it also allows us to explore possibilities like what it might uh, it be to have a collision involving, say, a pure dark matter halo as its companion collision. So again, to compare this with some of the previous simulations, here is what one of these might look like. Um, on the left here is the gas, and on the right is what it looks like in terms of stars. So we have our galaxies standardly rotating. And so this is just before a collision with say a dark matter halo. And again, in both the gas and the stars, we're able to see what that structure looks like in terms of the expanding ring in both the stars and the gas and how it dissipates over time. Uh, we can look at this in terms of just start, the evolved GIS, disk, and after the pass. And then um, here's another example of just some of the ways in which changing the parameters might impact this. Uh, here we're changing the halo concentration class, how concentrated the halo is. Um, and we can see things like the higher the concentration class, the stronger effect of the ring that we end up seeing in the results. And one of the other really nice things is you can also take a look at the velocity field to get a sense for what this looks like. Okay, so that's the science side of things and talking a little bit about a very particular case study involving simulations and observations. Let me now switch gears uh, to talk a little bit more about the philosophical analysis and let me raise a couple philosophical questions. Namely, how do astrophysicists in these cases re generate reliable inferences about the use um, uh, from simulations? And what role are these computer simulations playing in these kinds of projects, which I think are uh, in some sense common in nature? I wanna argue that there are at least three critical roles computer simulations are playing in this Context. Again, namely hypothesis testing, exploring possibility space, and amplifying observations. Okay, so talking a little first about hypothesis testing, what I mean when I say this is cases when a scientist develops a specific hypothesis and uses a simulation to determine the likelihood of a hypothesis um, or to refute it completely. So I think we saw this in the case that I've been talking about historically in the original 1976 simulations, which were just a mere, uh, merely a matter of how possibly testing, um, trying to figure out if it's, this is how these ring galaxies came to have this shape. We then also saw this with sort of the, the, the other collisions that we looked at. These simulations are testing the hypothesis of the rings obtaining their shape through these collisions and if the cause is competent to produce it. Uh, we also see this testing as the simulations become more complex, moving from part, part, point particle simulations to the more complex simulations with feedback and fluid dynamics. Uh, these simulations are developing in order to account for more observational features of the real world system. So some of those things that were originally idealized away. Um, the simulations are developing in order to account for these and the features of the target system are added back in. We see the accuracy and details of these simulations improving as well. Um, and so the development of this complexity also seems to be providing some of the simulations inferential power too. Three minutes, please. 
Uh, so the second role that they're serving is uh, constraining possibility space. So by this, I mean something like running a simulation with multiple different parameters um, and in order to establish an, an understanding of the boundaries at which inside a phenomena takes place or not. Um, so as I mentioned, this is just a step in the process. Uh, the knowledge and the observation of these individual galaxies um, are constraining it. So that's one space that the, obser uh, the observations are constraining. Um, but it also serves a role very similar to what scientists refer to as robustness analysis, which aims at identifying robust phenomena and robust theorems. Um, so in terms of exploring possibility space, this is similar to robustness analysis, but it is a bit more open-ended and it's a bit less direct. Robustness analysis is often trying to show that a, a, a specific result is robust, but rather the exploring possibility space is just trying to understand under what spaces various things might be possible. And so the third role is amplifying observations. This occurs when the output of simulation provides this new and sometimes unexpected context to interpret results. Um, in this way, simulations often uh, allow for astronauts to yield more information out of the original observational snapshot than was there uh, in per originally. And so one of these things that I think is really interesting with this is um, with ring galaxies in particular, there are these specific structures called spoke structures. Now from an observation alone, you can't really get much information about those spoke structures, but it's through seeing them come up in the simulations themselves that you're able to have a better sense at what time in the galaxy's formation these do and do not occur. So though, the, though they are originally there in the observation, it's only through the simulation that you get that sort of time aspect to it. Uh, and so you can then go back to a picture like this and have after the simulations a better sense for its temporal um, sequencing at what point in it uh, the creation it occurred. All right, so to just conclude in the context of this project, I think, think simulations are playing these three important roles. Um, and I think this project serves to show more generally how things might work with simulations and observations in astrophysics more broadly. Um, I think the field of astrophysics is a field in which the epistemic uses of simulations are particularly salient given the limitations I discussed early on in this talk and the heavy reliance on technology more generally. Um, but I think the analysis may be generalizable to other observation-based sciences as well. And so this might also be a really interesting area where astronomy and astrophysics might look to other disciplines to see how they account for sort of this historical aspect to their sciences. All right, thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot, Melissa. Thank you a lot. Um, so, I yes, so we have a question, sir, from Wolfgang. If you can unmute yourself. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for for this really interesting talk. Um, now, combining this with the talk we heard this morning about um, the idea that we can never prove something to be true but we can only like rule things out. Isn't there a danger now in the exact example that is sort of showed that we have produced something that sort of has the right story to explain the observations, but is not true? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a difficult thing. I'm, 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 well, I'm criticizing in a positive sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, and again, I think one of the spaces that is really interesting is, uh, how there's so there's so many so many cases in which it may be poss possible or impossible to fully refute a theory, um, especially these cases where it might be like you know detecting a particle is one thing, um, but it might be the case that given our capacities just as humans, we may never be able to actually detect a dark metal particle. So what do we do in that whole space in between there? Um, and so I think this is one of the spaces where there are these more messier or more complex aspects to science where you may or may not necessarily be able to get pure Popperian refutation and falsification, but nonetheless, science is still making really interesting progress. In these cases, we're still learning more about the ring galaxies. Um, and so this uh, tries to unpack what that reasoning looks like when you aren't presented with pure refutation or, 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 or not. 
Yeah, uh, we have for a comment on the chat. I, uh, well, I will uh, I will do it quickly. Otherwise, uh, we can move it to the later discussion. So as is known over the years, this is Professor Norma Sanchez. This cold armatobarium recipes prescription simulation do not solve all the by now well-known problems and do not match the well-known and robust small-scale observations. The problem is not the simulation, but the nature of dark matter. Yeah, I mean, so that's one of the possibilities. One of the other spaces that I think is really interesting in these various models is tying it back to some of the methodological challenges that it's up against. So um, namely the role of idealizations and approximations and what those play in the modeling processes or the simulating processes themselves. Um, I think that's one of the spaces where sometimes you might chalk it up to refutation, but some of the other op options on the table are things like, well, some of the idealizations we made weren't correctly justified. And so again, thinking of small scale uh, individual galaxies, you need stellar feedback. And so if you don't see the, what you're expecting on the small scale, when you know, say, stellar feedback is super important to galaxy formation, maybe that's something that rather than refuting it, you need to go back to the drawing board and say, was it an appropriate decision to idealize those things away? Um, and it might not be the case, in which case you need to add it back in and see what your results are then. Thanks a lot. Uh, so we will... Uh... We will go back to the discussion because I see some dissents on the chat. That's very nice. Um, so thank you again, Melissa. And uh, we move on to Anthony's, uh, Anthony, Anthony, sorry if I misspelled your, your name. It's okay, it's okay. Sorry, <laughs> really. <laughs> so yes, you can share your screen. Yes. So Anthony is going to talk about reliability, informativeness, and sensitivities in dark matter simulations. Please go ahead. OK. Uh, so I guess you can't see my screen. Yes, we see it. Okay. Uh, so before I begin, uh, let me just thank you for having me here today uh, and just say that uh, uh, we, we as philosophers of science, and I think the other philosophers here will agree, we are always very happy to exchange our views and make our, our work um, and communicate our work to scientists and hear their views about these issues. And, this, and actually, we're happy to share these views with anyone else who's interested in the methodology of science and the problems that uh, are, arise in astrophysics and other fields. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, dark, matter, dark matter research and some uh, challenges therein. Uh, regarding the reliability, informativeness, and model sensitivity uh, of the various methods for dark matter observation. So the take home message uh, from this talk is that in order to learn more about the nature of dark matter, we need to enrich uh, what we will call the common core of the various possible models for dark matter. And one way to do this is by using robustness arguments from the variability of experiments. But as we will see there are significant problems and limitations in using these arguments uh, to enrich the common core. So as an outline, I will first briefly talk about the possible models about the nature of dark matter. Uh, and then I will talk about the five methods for acquiring information or observing dark matter. Uh, then I will talk about the informativeness, the model sensitivity and the reliability of these methods. I will say what the limits are for robustness arguments in these cases. And then I will close with what I call the puzzle of dark matter observation. So uh, as you'll probably know, there are many competing model scenarios about the nature of dark matter. Some of these models concern the particle nature of dark matter. Uh, some of these are within the standard model of particle physics, others uh, are extensions. Uh, and we also have uh, possible model scenarios about the large scale structure of dark matter in terms of primordial, primordial black holes and other large scale structures. And we of course have alternative scenarios of gravity as we've seen earlier today. So uh, what is common within all these scenarios about the possible nature of dark matter is what uh, a colleague of ours, Nils Martens, calls the thinnest common core. So this is a minimum set of constraints, which is common within all these models. So every, every possible suggestion 
uh, about the nature of dark matter or the explanation of dark phenomena in the skies has to satisfy this minimum set of constraints. So uh, dark matter is some sort of stuff that either contributes around 27% to the total cosmic mass energy budget or acts as if it does so, being responsible for certain gravity media observables, which we call dark phenomena, related to structure formation, clusters, and galaxies. So here you can see uh, the five possible methods of observe dark matter observation, where, where observation should be understood here in a broad scientific sense of acquiring information about the nature of dark matter. So we can learn about dark matter with precision measurements on cosmological observables, like the cosmological microwave background. Uh, and we also learn about dark matter by observing its gravitational effects from rotational curves, gravitational lens phenomena, et cetera. We also have direct searches. An example is a xenon experiment discussed earlier. We have indirect searches where we want to detect the products of dark matter annihilation, the standard model products of dark matter annihilation in the local region. And then you have collider searches where we hope that we will, we will, produce, uh, we will produce some uh, dark matter particles and then detect their products. So uh, all these are methods for <clears throat> Acquiring, so, uh, acquiring information about that matter. Uh, and so far, we, we, we've only seen uh, some results from these two methods, whereas from the other methods, we are only able to uh, constrain the parameter space of models. Now, the question I started uh, studying when I first um, <clears throat> started working on dark matter is how we can evaluate and compare the epistemic strength of these different methods. And when I say, when I talk about the epistemic strength, I mean, how can we evaluate, evaluate what we can actually get from these different possible ways uh, of learning about dark matter? So <clears throat> one can come up with three criteria. The first is, is the informativeness, which is the ability of a method to provide information on a number of different properties of dark matter. The second is the model sensitivity of each method, which is the ability of a method to provide information on a range of different possible model scenarios of dark matter and their submodels. And uh, third, and most importantly, <clears throat> we're interested in the reliability of each method, which is basically the ability of a method to consistently, consistently provide robust and infallible results that <clears throat> uh, will point out to the real values of the parameters we are probing. Now, when we talk about the informativeness, what is important to keep in mind is that uh, the extracted information about the possible properties of dark matter from each method is always conditional or dependent, if you wish, on three different sets of assumptions. So the first set is the experimental models we use in each particular method. And you can understand this as the various models we introduce in an experiment in order to design the experiment and uh, extract results from it. So in the case of collider searches, for, for instance, you can think of the experimental models as the models we use uh, to model the interaction of the product particles with the detector. So depending on which model we introduce to uh, understand the interaction of the product particles with the detector, we will get different results. We will interpret the data in a different way. So the information we get uh, from each method depends on this kind of models. And you can also include in this uh, category uh, the various simulations used in the experiments that are relevant for carrying out the, the, the experiment. So the second set of assumptions is what I call extrapolating assumptions. So these are usually the assumptions we introduced after we acquire the data in order to get some results. So for example, in the case of direct searches, uh, in order to get some meaningful results, one has to make some assumptions about the density of dark matter in the local region and the distribution. So <clears throat> uh, again, the result depends on what kind of assumption one introduces and different working groups come up with different uh, values about the local density. So you can see that the result depends on which uh, assumption one introduces. And of course, the third, uh, category is uh, the, the model scenario we're actually probing. So for instance, when we derive constraints on the mass of WIMPs, weakly interactive massive particles, we assume that dark matter is, 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 is indeed a, a weakly interactive massive particle, right? So uh, the results are model specific. 
Now, when it comes to model sensitivity, the ability of each method to give information about different uh, models of dark matter, I've made this tentative uh, table here. So please take it with a pinch of salt because the situation might well change in the future. But this is just an example where you can see in the horizontal level, the five different methods for learning and restricting the parameter space of dark matter models. And then you can see some examples from some model scenarios. Uh, and then you can see which method can actually give information about which model. And you can see here why WIMPs are so popular because they, are, they can be propped by different methods, right? But uh, for instance, sterile neutrinos can only be propped uh, via indirect searches. So we can't really learn anything about sterile neutrinos uh, in collided searches. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the reliability of the results, so a, perfect reliable, a perfectly reliable method is a method whose results consistently have zero deviation from the actual values of the physical properties of dark matter. Now, given that we don't have an independent way to actually uh, test or cross-check our uh, methods of observation, how do we know if our methods are reliable, if our only access to dark matter is via within these methods? So there are various strategies used in science. Uh, one particular one, the particular one is the variability of experiments. So when we, what we want to do is to obtain the same result by using different observational methods. And the argument in this case uh, is that if the same result is obtained by different methods, then we have good reasons to believe that our methods are reliable or, and I'm quoting Ian Hacking here, it would be a preposterous coincidence if the same patterns were produced by two, two totally different kinds of physical systems. So the idea is very simple. We use different experiments and if the experiments agree, then we have good reasons. We, we, we increase the degree of belief uh, in a particular model. Now notice that this is different uh, from the strategy of repeating the same experiment as is the case with the Dama Libra ex experiment and the Dama Libra result. In that case, we have a repetition of the same experiment by different groups. But this argument is supposed to be stronger because what you actually have here is the same result by using two different uh, types of experiments, right? Now, what I want to show uh, and what, what I actually realized when I started working on these issues is that there are specific limits uh, for using this kind of arguments in the case of dark matter research. So two initial problems. The first is that compared to the variety of models, there is relatively little overlap between different methods that are able to probe the same models. So for example, we've, we've seen in the table that sterile neutrinos can only be brought, probed by indirect searches and axions can only be probed by, in, by direct searches. So de facto, in these cases, we can't really use different types of experiments to compare the results. But this is not so big of a problem. The second problem is that even in the overlapping cases, it is not clear when and if, if, and if different methods are indeed probing the same properties. Uh, and I'm sure you, you know better than me that most of the time, both works on constraining properties cover fairly small and often disjoint areas of, of the relevant parameter space. So for instance, uh, WIMPs are better probed in the low mass regions in collider searches, whereas heavier models with heavier particles are better uh, constrained by direct searches. So the results in this case are what, uh, the Genga calls incongruent, right? Now, the third and most important problem that I want to emphasize is that even in the cases where multiple techniques are ostensibly able to provide concordant results, results that agree, ensuring that these results are indeed in agreement is a very difficult, if not impossible task. And the reason for this is precisely because the results of each method are always conditional and dependent on the experimental models of the method, the extrapolating assumptions, and the model dependence of each method. So ensuring that two different methods that are probing the same quantity parameter of a model actually provide concordant results requires taking into consideration the effects of these assumptions in the final results, which is the task of compatibility and complementarity studies which nonetheless are very difficult and I assume extremely rare because I wasn't able to find any, uh, many of them. So 
just to sum up what I've said so far in the form of an argument. Uh, in order to enforce the reliability of a result based on the variability of experiments, the different experiments must provide the same result, which further means that they must be probing the same target. Now, ensuring that the results are in agreement requires that the methods are constraining the same model, the same parameter of the model, and that the effects of the experimental models and extrapolating assumptions have been taken into consideration. So two conclusions. Uh, the first is that the arguments for reliability, sorry about this. Oh, sorry. Okay. The first is that the arguments for reliability from the variability of experiments are only available within methods based on the same model, and hence they can only be used for models that can be probed by a more than one method. The second is that the comparison of concordant results from different methods is extremely difficult. <laughs> I, think I, I think, yeah, this will not happen again. Yeah, we, you have just one minute, so you have Okay, I'm up. almost done, I'm almost done. So some preliminary conclusions and more general conclusions. While the use of robustness arguments is a good practice to distinguish between competing submodels of a specific dark matter model scenario, uh, this leaves the essential question about the nature of dark matter untouched. The point is that no matter how well corroborated a specific submodel is, the fact that the data are model dependent in the first place means that there is no way of ensuring that the early alternative scenarios for the nature of dark matter should be ruled out. Uh, comparability studies are extremely important because they provide the ground for robustness analysis. Uh, and in general, robustness arguments face important limitations in dark matter searches, and I guess this partially explains why there's slow progress in dark matter research. Okay, and we always have to have in mind that even in the fortunate event of, dark matter, of a dark matter particle discovery by one or more of these methods, there's still a long way to actually determine uh, the, the, the real properties of this particle and which model best accommodates this result, the results. Now this, uh, this leads uh, to what I call the puzzle of dark matter observation and I'm finishing now, uh, which is the following. To learn more about the nature of dark matter is to reduce a large number of possible models to a single true model or a set of true models that are supported by observation and evidence and adequately capture the behavior of dark matter in the universe. The way to reduce a number of these models is by enriching the common set of constraints from which these models are built, which will event eventually preclude certain model scenarios for the nature of dark matter and favor others, right? However, it seems that the only way of gathering more reliable information by the various observational methods is by presupposing the very same models for which there is no independent specific observational evidence at the first place. And I think this is just a special case of a more general worry that uh, is often found in physics. But in order to get further results, we have to presuppose that our current theories are correct, at least to a certain extent. Thank you and apologies for the technical issues. Thank you a lot, uh, Anthony. Um, so uh, let's see if there is any questions on the Zoom platform. Yes, go ahead, Fiona. Can you unmute yourself? Fiona Thompson, yeah, you have raised your hand. Okay. Okay, I don't see it in the chat. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Thank you very much for unmuting me. Antonis, thank you very much for uh, the talk. I enjoyed it. I was going to just say at the end that you seem to indicate that the different types of experiments would come up with the same result. So kind of flip it around and it being that different experiments give different viewpoints of the same phenomena and that they never really come up with the same result. It is different views. And then the next step is then in the discussion and the comparison. 
of what these different viewpoints actually mean? Well, yeah, this is a really good point. Uh, it, it might be the case that different methods give information about different aspects of dark matter, uh, which is perfectly fine. Uh, but what I'm saying is that in this case, we can't really cross-check uh, these results. This doesn't mean that they are wrong, uh, but this indicates once again that the fact that we have so many different models that are all compatible with this minimum set of constraints make this a very challenging task. So we can imagine a, a scenario where different, two different methods give uh, two different results, but insofar as these results can be accommodated by different models, uh, I don't see how we can actually introduce these results in this common core which is the minimum set of constraints for, for our models. So this is a challenging situation, which is what I'm trying to point out. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another question from Norma Sanchez. Go ahead. Yes, thank, uh, good morning, thank you very much. I, I will be, be uh, very briefly because uh, there is, uh, I found uh, a very confusion, confusing, uh, um, adding confusion to a problem which is already uh, um, confused, uh, which is already confused even in the uh, literature. So uh, the approach taken in particular uh, to address the problem of dark matter um, is, uh, here in this uh, in these presentations, um, even do not allow to uh, to clarify some fundamental issues, which is um, the problem of of uh, uh, galaxies, and uh, uh, is completely related to the uh, problem of dark matter uh, dark matter nature, and um, which is the essential ingredient. This is for the previous talk because it was related, and um, in particular for this one. And all this, um, all this, uh, adding to uh, adding to not fundamental issues uh, to all the presentation make this um, make this uh, well. Uh, uh, what appears? Uh, what appears here? You, yourself. Cannot uh, cannot set what uh, could be the best way to attack the problem. So um, the literature there exists literature at the point uh, clarifying um, the directions to take um, to go uh, reaching the observations, and the problem is do not follow all the literature which is already in the wrong direction, but to try to clarify and to take the right directions. So uh, in the list, I conclude, in the list uh, of, uh, of um, issues uh, you present, there are the experimental particle physics, the, observ the astrophysical observations, the models in particle physics set a resume and all in the astrophysics. And there is a, a and, and this must be clarified with predictive physical models or physical theories, not without adding ad hoc to ad hoc to ad hoc prescription or ingredients. And uh, many of, uh, of your analysis on the particle physics and why these are not detecting and so on are not a philosophical question. We are not here, uh, uh, we are not here uh, experimenting on trying to prove the origin of the universe, of, of, of the quantum mechanics problems of interpretation and observation. We are dealing with experiments which are very real observations in astrophysics which are very real uh, it's not uh, unknown uh, unknown universe so uh, we need to update knowledge uh, knowledge this is already 
in the in publish it are working and uh, try to clarify and not to add confusion. And um, of course, philosophy is in the game, but the problem uh, we are, you are addressing is not a philosophical problem, even, um, even if that is an important ingredient. So that is an escape. That is a, a fuit and avant, uh, unconscious perhaps, but it's not the right direction to take. And it is very important because it's a lot of physical, uh, partic uh, particle physical experiments and um, uh, astrophysical observation here. And of course, a lot of people working uh, on that. It's not a problem to have uh, much bigger computers here to, to clarify the issue. Uh, we need to uh, take into account the thinking, the interpretation, and the uh, strong physical uh, arguments and knowledge, and knowledge here, which is not taken into account. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, I, we already started the discussion here, I guess. Uh, so I don't know whether, Anthony, you want to add anything. Otherwise, we start uh, the general discussion with, with the help of Federico. I think, we, I, I think we can continue with the general discussion. OK. OK, good. So we have a lot of interesting uh, addition in the chat, which I guess refer more on the general on the general discussion. I don't know whether people writing in the chat would like to speak up and uh, start addressing some of the issues. OK, we have Shri, Shrikant. Sorry if I pronounce it not correctly. Uh, Yes, mom, you, you pronounced it correctly. Uh, so thank you for all, all the speakers and uh, panelists. I had a question for David uh, Merritt, if he's still here. So, uh, sure, can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so in your talk, you mentioned about uh, Karl Popper's uh, viewpoint where uh, a theory should not be, able, should not accommodate everything without uh, room for it being refuted, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. This was one of the views. And so my question is, uh, I would like to know your opinion, whether scientists should focus on, I mean, there are disc localized discrepancies in every field of science in general. And should scientists focus to understand these discrepancies and solve them uh, better? Or should uh, scientists pursue, uh, should scientists be in pursuit of a grand theory of everything or a grand unified theory that's been going on for many decades now in the hope that once the theory is formulated, all these discrepancies will be taken care of by itself. This was just a thought I wanted to know your uh, opinion about. Well, my opinion probably isn't worth much, but I would say neither one. First of all, <clears throat> just a personal opinion about grand unified theories. There is no such thing. There will never be a final theory. Theories are always conjectural and always will be. Um, so I don't think that's the right place to look. I think a, a more useful answer to your question would be, um, it depends on what question you're addressing. If you want to understand um, a particular anomaly in a given theory, then you should work on it. But if your question is which theory is right, you know, does dark matter exist or not, then that changes your research direction and research methods. Um, techniques that work very well for uh, examining the first sort of problem don't work at all well for the second. Um, take simulations, for instance. Um, it's easy to think of problems in many fields of science where large-scale simulations are the only way to go. If I want to predict the weather in Cleveland tomorrow, I do a large-scale simulation. If I want to understand the possibilities of protein folding, I have to do simulations and so forth. <clears throat> but I think nobody would claim that that's the way to test the theoretical assumptions that are embodied in those simulation codes. No climatologist would say, well, I've simulated the weather tomorrow in Cleveland. I got the wrong answer. Therefore, the Navier-Stokes equations must be wrong. Um, the simulator would understand that there are many possible reasons why the prediction based on the simulation was wrong, which have nothing to do with the fundamental theory because simulations are so, as somebody said, uh, motley. Um, so if you're 
Question is, how might galaxies form and evolve in Lambda CDM? Yep, I would do a simulation. If the question is, does dark matter exist? I would want to avoid simulations at all possible costs. I would want to look for predictions of the theories that are as robust as possible, as little affected as possible by the uncertainties associated with simulations. Uh, I guess that's enough. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sir. Yeah, this helps. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you David. Uh, Volka? A question and a comment. No, a comment and a question. Um, the comment is, first of all, I feel like we're, we're, we're drifting into the, into the dogmatic and ideological fight between Mond and, and, and uh, dark matter, rather than discussing the, um, rather than just discussing like, you know, the philosophy of our field and sort of like, I'm you know, trying to understand like, you know, what are the things that we are potentially doing well and what are the things that we are potentially not doing well from a really grand point of view of, of philosophy, which is the underlying science of, of essentially of, of us all. Um, that was my comment. My question is, um, one of the issues that I've always had, and, and then people, people have put this in a really nice way called harking, hypothesizing after results are known, is that we sort of like, you know, detect, we're, we're discovery driven signs and we detect things and, and then we're, we're poised to make stories about it. So for example, as, as Melissa uh, nicely showed, like, you know, we see ring galaxies and then we're sort of trying to, to go and, and we're trying to find out like, you know, how, how these work and then we make simulations. Um, so this is one thing we do. And we, we do this through simulations because also again, as Melissa nicely put it, is we don't have the ability to really fully understand the universe in the sense that we can't watch time evolution. So we, we need to do something about this. So I'm wondering from the different panelists, what is your point of view of like, you know, how do we use simulation as when, and these might be different points of view, how do we use simulations as well as observations to unravel fundamental or at least rule out theories that we have or in ideally uh, unravel fundamental truths about the universe. And I think this would be a great thing to sort of like, you know, have from different points of view that all of you have um, to, 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 to start this as a discussion. And I'm gonna shut up now. Thank you, Volker. Is anyone who wants to? So I, I guess I, I can go first. Um, I, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that's, uh, as I said, that's the question that I'm motivated by in my research. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it, to some extent, at least from what I've seen, comes down to being really reflective and really pragmatic about identifying exactly where observations are playing and identifying exactly where theories are playing a role in either building the simulations or in testing them to some extent. You know, there are some of these simulations that draw extremely heavily from theory, whereas others draw heavily on observation. Um, and I think attending to and being mindful of where they're coming in in the construction process, and to some extent, I think this is the hardest part, being honest about where some of those leap, leaps of faith or heavy reliance lie can then help unpack when it, simulations either go really well or go poorly, why that's responsible. Is it because the simulation itself just couldn't actually accommodate the data or is it because there was this heavy reliance on, on theory? And so I think some of those point to spaces where it's easier to identify those cases of fine tuning, um, whereas others, it, it can show more so where where it is just sort of that ad hoc um, post post rational uh, reflection to some extent. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, is anyone uh, writing in the chat who would like to speak up or? Paula, there was an interesting comment mm -hmm. uh, regarding the talk of David Merritt from Giacomo Monari. So mm -hmm. I can try to summarize it because it was a long email. 
But essentially, ah, okay, I'm, yes, I miss yeah, it. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Giacomo Monari says that in his view, induction is legitimate in the framework of Bayesian probability theory. So the extended framework of um, logic, um, the extended logic of uncertainty. And he also cites um, a book by Jains, 2003, in which uh, essentially uh, it is shown that um, using prior information, one can actually use induction in a mathematical framework in the indeed uh, bias um, statistical framework. Uh, then he makes also another point which is that different theories uh, like MON or Lambda CDM could be weighted on the same data uh, using arguments like the Occam razors. So I don't know if David or any other one has something to, to comment about this. I'll say a little bit, it's a, it's a big question. Um, I mentioned in my talk, I suggested that some generations are more amenable to the idea that induction doesn't work than others. Our current generation, you know, not so much. Um, and I've seen arguments in the literature, which, <clears throat> uh, how do I say it, are problematic at best uh, in favor of induction. In particular, um, as you just mentioned, uh, the idea that, well, you can't generalize from discrete examples, but at least you can assign probabilities to certain explanations. Um, two points about that. First, this is not the way scientists proceed. All right, They use Bayes' theorem to derive parameters of functions, they don't use it to decide between theories. And the second point is, there's a good reason for that. I have no idea how one would do that. And I hate to keep quoting Popper, but he nailed it. He said, there is simply no way to assign prior probabilities to universal statements. The only uh, legitimate uh, assumption is that they have either zero probability or if you're dogmatic, the probability is one. But either way, you're not going to change that probability by adducing uh, observational evidence. Um, gosh, uh, that's my view and it's probably not shared by everyone, but um, yeah. Yeah. What would you say about the Occam razor is also to subjective? No, no, not necessarily. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Occam's razor is saying something like, you know, uh, what's the simplest explanation? And there is a sense in which theories can be compared based on simplicity. It's, it's a problematic basis, but for instance, let me give you the example that I talked about in, in my talk. Um, I showed that one theory uh, makes a definite prediction, a testable prediction, uh, about a particular relation. The other theory uh, does not. And you could say the reason that the other theory does not is because it's less simple. It contains a lot of bells and whistles, uh, adjustable parameters that uh, aren't required by the first theory. So I think in a case like that, you can definitely say that one theory is simpler than the other. In this case, simplicity and testability and falsifiability all go together. Um, they're in a sense aspects of the same thing. So yes, I would absolutely agree that a more testable theory, that is to say in this context, very limited, a simpler theory is the preferred explanation. Why? Because the simpler theory um, puts itself out there. It, it's more easily tested and therefore refuted if the prediction is false. Whereas the less simple theory, uh, it's, it's harder to get a, an accurate idea of what is predicting. Is that what he meant by Occam's razor? I think so, but from your answer, I presume that you assign the concept of simplicity only to predictions, right? Not to explanations in general. No, I assign, it to, I assign it to theories. Um, yes, because and, for example, one could say, you know, Lambda CDM can explain the CMB in a relatively simple way because it has, by assumption, uh, two components. Whereas in a MOND framework, you need a uh, elaborate theory with additional fields and degrees of freedom that behaves sort of as a uh, dark matter fluid. No, I don't think I would agree so, with that. I, I don't think I would agree with that. 
Um, I don't no, think so I'm saying, but this, you know, as, as you said at some point in your talk, applies to the um, observ uh, observables that are used to build the theory, not necessarily to the prediction that are made starting from that um, theory. Right. Yeah, I guess the way I would say it is uh, neither theory can make strong claims to be supported by the CMD, CMB data because both theories only accommodate those data in a retrospective fashion by adjusting parameters. We could quibble about which theory adjusts the most parameters, um, but you also have to take into account the fact that Lambda CDM uh, in early accommodations of the CMB data had to introduce inconsistencies in their model by adjusting parameters like the baryon density that weren't there before. So I'm not sure how you count those when it comes to assessing simplicity. <clears throat> but I would also argue that um, simplicity is, is a difficult concept. Einstein's theory is much less simple than Newton's, but we still prefer it. Okay, we have other uh, raise hands. So we have again Wolfgang and Norma. So yeah, um, so. Sorry, I, mean, you know, I, I, love, I love having these philosophical discussions and there's a fairly point where we can, we can have them. Um, so, I mean, talking about the prior, the prior um, discussion that you, that you just had. So, I mean, you know, like normally priors are used to, to sort of like you know, bound problems or essentially bound problems where you say like, oh, temperatures must be greater than zero or things like this. But I mean, David raised an interesting point and sort of said like, okay, um, but can we really use priors uh, for sort of fundamental questions? And for me, then the question is like, you know, but we must be able to learn something from previous experiments, right? I mean, it cannot be that every experiment we do is like, you know, done in this complete space of ignorance. There are priors that flow into our work, I would think. And I mean, this is again a question for everyone. Um, I'm not sure I can give a good answer, except to say that, sure, uh, the more tests your theory passes, the more you're going to likely think that it's correct, at least provisionally. I just have no idea, and I don't, I'm not convinced anybody does, about how to quantitatively assess past support. As we've seen, well, Newton's theory for 200 years made nothing but astonishingly correct and accurate predictions, but it's wrong. So somebody circa you know, 1900 would have said, well, the, the, the prior probability of Newton's theory being correct is just, just very close to one, uh, but it was wrong. The theory was wrong. So uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure I see the, the usefulness of arguing in that way. Okay, thanks. We have Norma and then Richard Sanders. <laughs> Thank you. I, I agree with David um, what, uh, what he said, and I think it's an important ingredient uh, and simplicity, and uh, if, if simplicity is uh, going uh, with observation. Simplicity is, I said, uh, I, I prefer to, to talk about uh, predictivity because a theory must be predictive, and must be tested and confronted to observations. And then, uh, as, as David said, uh, general relativity. I mean, once one understand a, a problem, then, uh, and the problem, and is the right understanding, this becomes simpler. And the history of physics uh, is like that. And uh, 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 an example is general relativity. So if general relativity has been tested and, and, all the, and all what we have at the moment, and even black holes and so on, is uh, we are uh, really in a problem with uh, uh, the dark matter and galaxy formation situation. Because I can say in my that, uh, short uh, experience of uh, more than 40 years in cosmology, having seen the construction of the standard model in cosmology, that the only, the only problem which remains confused 
I mean, for, for the majority, uh, and there are, there are right direction going on, is the, is the galaxy formation and the dark matter problem. And all the other have been progresses and detections or even bigger constraints. And it's not a problem here of philosophy. And it's not a problem of the simulation. And even it's not a problem that we need better computer or better uh, machines or experiments. The problem is that there is an inertia also. This meeting is well posted to, 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 to take uh, this point. The inertia of the community set of or the lines or thinkings, the absence of cross correlations between the different uh, part of knowledge and the people which need to unify or to cross-correlate the knowledge, observation has updated them with all the progress. And the, the, clear, the clear example here was the, 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 the presentation on the dark matter, which is the huge, the most confusing presentation on the problem I have seen till now. <laughs> and so, which is a compliment, is, I mean, I, now, I, say, I try to, to take the fact to really go on and to go uh, to go on in the right directions. Otherwise, we uh, otherwise there are a lot of, uh, of of there are a lot of knowledge which is missed and wrong directions which are taken, and a lot of people which are which are taking those directions. And this is a problem, not because it, it, one progress like that and all, all, all that. That is a superficial. Uh, said explanation, take uh, more. Uh, no, the problem is just that uh, there is a great energy, and now, and now the, the models which need to be uh, will be um, forgotten, need to be forgotten, and those directions which work need to develop. Otherwise, we have a problem with galaxies, simulations, dark matter, and all what has been presented in this, in this, um, in this last uh, huge confusion. And that is not problem. It is not possible. As a scientist, we cannot, uh, we cannot accept uh, this kind of situation set to make progress. This is a, this is a call to really to really sit down and make a critical view on the past 25 years, at least, in the dark matter, in particular, because there is no detection, and that is a grid, this is a grid file. And even for those dedicated experiments, that's, that's the, the conclusions are clear. I mean, I, I have. Thank so, you, Norma. Let, 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 I would like to leave also the floor to the younger generation here. Uh, otherwise, it's only so. Uh, I don't know whether Julia, before re, going uh, to Richard, whether Julia or Anthony is, or Melissa would like to 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 add to anything or even going into towards another direction. I mean, one of the things that I, I really actually liked about Julia's presentation um, was starting to draw attention to spaces that are focused more on testing theory versus those more like either less abstract or more abstract spaces, especially tying things down to models, because I think this also goes back to something David mentioned um, earlier. I think there are some cases where we really are testing models and models can serve different purposes. They can aim to be descriptive. They might just need to describe the matter of the facts or they might actually aim to be prescriptive um, or predictive the way sort of weather pattern models are. Um, but again, sort of going back to what David said, if you get a bad prediction out of a weather model, you don't necessarily point to the theory behind it. Um, you don't say, oh, the model didn't work for predicting weather today, so the Navier strokes must be wrong. It's tied more to looking at those, as Julia sort of had, those what's going on at that level with respect to, to the model specifically. Maybe 
Um, maybe in some cases it's really good at predicting, but in other cases it's not as good, or maybe thinking about it as even serving that other purpose, moving from my model's really good at predicting things to, and because I think it's good at predicting things, it's also good at explaining things. I think those are different, different tasks we can take and expect models to do either well at or not well at, and to different standards than going back up the the, the line to, to the theories more generally. You want a theory to be predictive and explanatory, but you might not expect that of models. And so I think the other thing that might be useful is thinking more closely about what are the models that we're constructing trying to do? Are they trying to do that higher level theory they're trying to explain and predict or are they really just really good predictive models that we happen to want to also do that higher level thing? And so I just really liked um, Julia's talk, trying to draw attention to those different levels at which they might be working to. Mesa, we received a question that I think we have just addressed, but I would like to read it um, you know, for uh, correctness. So Shrikant Najesh, I hope I spelled the name correctly, says, is it better to have a predictive theory or a theory that can accommodate multiple observations? So for example, general relativity predicted that gravitational waves propagates at the speed of light, while Scortes and collaborators shows that the relativistic mode can accommodate for this fact a posteriori in principle. Um, so, the issue of is it better to have a predictive theory on a small subset of issues or a more general uh, theory with more explan explanatory power? I think that's the question that uh, Najesh was asking. So I don't know if anyone else has something to add to this, maybe Julia or Antonis. Oh, um, if I can add uh, something to what Melissa said about models, uh, um, also um, I think that maybe uh, the the philosophical part of the literature is uh, focused on the dark matter and cosmology, but I think that uh, the case of solar physics uh, can be um, a good uh, a good framework. Uh, for the issues about uh, models instead of theories, because there uh, you don't know everything, but maybe you know uh, more things. So it's uh, easier to speak about uh, models and to, to look at the, um, the question about the prediction and epistemic knowledge. Uh, so maybe, I, I didn't find a lot of literature about this, uh, about solar physics uh, in the context, philosophy of solar physics, but I think it could be an interesting uh, framework for the, um, for, um, for the issue about uh, models instead of theories. I see there is a raised hand by Bob Sanders. Joe Sanders, yes, yes, yes. but I, yes, I, yeah, I put in a stopover because I wanted to have also some opinion of people of a younger generation. That, but you're right. Please, uh, Richard, go ahead. I was just wondering whether we have seen it. No, 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 no. I didn't miss him. I've <laughs> missed some before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Yes. Um, okay, well, I'm, I don't really qualify as a member of the younger generation anymore, <laughs> but uh, I would like to address this remark to David. I, I, David, first of all, I thought it was a very, very good talk, and you, you mentioned uh, Popper's emphasis of falsification. A good theory should, in fact, a scientific theory should be falsifiable, and I think that's undoubtedly true. But in, in astronomy, falsification is not always... Um, is not always so transparent, it's not always so clear. Uh, and I can give you a recent example. There's been a claim by a group of observers and very competent observers that no dark matter is necessary in a certain ultra diffuse galaxy. In fact, as a class of galaxies, these gas rich ultra diffuse, ultra -diffuse galaxies lie off the Tully Fisher relationship, the standard baryonic Tully Fisher law. Now, um, 
See, they say that moreover, they've done careful synthesis observations and they say that the, uh, the rotation curve can be explained entirely by the, by the baryonic matter, that uh, uh, no, no dark matter is necessary. In fact, that, that would certainly rule out Mond as well. So my question is, does this constitute a falsification? That is to say, um, there are hundreds of galaxies that lie on the, the, the Tully-Fisher relationship, but these are six that don't. How many, how many do you need for a falsification? Uh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> um, I, I will say that uh, this idea of critical rationalism was explicitly directed not just toward theories, not just toward testing of theories, but toward observations and their interpretation. Everything should be criticized. Um, and it's only after you subject, subject observations to critical analysis by different people and using different methods that you can make a definite statement that a prediction has been refuted. So yeah, I'm fam familiar with those observations which seem to uh, taken at face value, um, refute the predictions of both theories. And that's fascinating. And I think people should think about what it might mean, but I don't have a strong opinion. Thank you. Nicole. <laughs> Thanks for, for unmuting me. <laughs> okay. um, my, my question is to David Merritt, and I wonder if we're if we're really understanding proper correctly or if we're applying proper in, in the right sense, because um, in, in, in this discussion now, I have the impression that there's kind of like two viewpoints. One, one viewpoint is that um, we, that, that kind of like, we don't know what the true theory is, but we, uh, but, but there must be one somewhere in the background. We just cannot quite figure out what it is. And the other viewpoint is that there really is nothing like scientific truth um, in, in a more absolute sense. I don't know if, 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 if I'm, I'm making myself clear. Um, and uh, as I said, I, I think the discussion that we have, it's kind of a mixture of both. When we compare, for example, Newton with GR, and, and then we say like, okay, Newton is, is simpler, but uh, GR is correct then in this sense, we kind of say that in an approximative sense, we have something like, 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 a, like, like a true um, working mechanism of how the universe works in the background, we just don't know what it is. And I'm not sure that is really the only interpretation that's possible. If we say that we can also only falsify um, a theory, we cannot prove it because we can also have a theory that would be a, um, a, a uh, intellectual construct or a human construct of understanding a certain set of observed phenomena? Well, that's a deep question. <clears throat> Let me just quickly ask you one. Wouldn't you agree that all theories are human constructs, period, full stop? Would you disagree with that statement? I wouldn't like it. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't okay. like it. I, I, have no doubt, I have no doubt that it's a true very correct, but uh, it, it makes science much less fun, doesn't it? It, it makes it much more uh, disturbing, right? Yeah. And I think I agree with you that it's easy to detect in statements of many scientists, the view that we know certain things, and I don't mean observable uh, instances, but theories in general. Um, I once read, for instance, a review article on dark matter by a renowned cosmologist who said uh, he disagrees with Mond because it's not derivable from GR. Um, and I was taken aback why should one theory be derivable from another? GR was uh, a conjecture. Einstein was very clear about that. He spent most of his life, actually, uh, before he died, trying to improve it. He didn't think it was the final word, um, or even that it was necessarily right. Um, so, I mean, I guess I would, the proper answer to the question, how do you know something, is I don't know it. I provisionally accept it as true, but only subject to further analysis. Or to put it differently, there is knowledge, but knowledge is all conjectural. Knowledge can grow, but it's never going to move from conjectural to certain. It can only become more certain. Uh, that's about as deep an answer as I can think to give you. So do you know? Do you know more formally which way Popper thought about it? Because I think you're probably the astronomer who knows Popper best of all. Of I can answer. I can answer that. He's, he was a realist. Not okay. of the current stripe, but of the older stripe that, that it is, uh, which said that there is an objective reality that exists outside of our conceptions of it. Um, and he gave one argument for realism, which may not impress you. He said, 
if you talk about the possibility of falsifying the theory, that implies an objective reality. Because if there wasn't one, you couldn't falsify anything. You couldn't say that it's wrong. Saying that something is wrong implies that there's something that's right. And that, he said, is his, his view of realism. Um, but he absolutely was a fallibilist. He absolutely would never have said, as you often hear nowadays in the literature, our best theory of gravity or the received theory of gravity. Mm -hmm. He would have said, that's nonsense. Uh, he said, that's, that, that would be a mistake to say things like that. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you a lot. Um, so Federico, is there anything there coming from uh, other chats, channels, or? I so didn't see have... anything, uh, but I have a small comment regarding the previous question from Bob Sanders. So I would personally say that if there are new observations that seems to falsify a theory, these new observations should have at least the same quality uh, or even better, higher quality than the observations that uh, sort of were in agreement with the theory before. So for the specific case that you mentioned, uh, my impression is that these galaxies that lie off the Talley-Fisher relation have um, data with lower quality in the sense of higher error bars. I will not say why it is, it's a technical issue, but for that reason, uh, my interpretation would be that we need to improve the quality of these measurements. And when these measurements have the same quality as the one that of galaxies that are on the Talley-Fisher relation, then we can tell whether the theory is uh, really disproved or not. I'm not sure whether this is uh, epistemologically or philosophically acceptable. So I would be glad to hear what other people think about this, but I guess, you know, um, having a quantification of the data quality uh, is, is an important thing when we are testing theories. Can I, can I add something on this and on the previous issues? So, sure. so the, the, a lot of the discussion surrounds uh, Popper's falsificationism and what Federico says now uh, relates uh, very well to a very well-known problem, uh, which is actually an objection to Popper's falsificationism, which goes back to Pierre Duhem and was uh, restated by a very well-known philosopher, uh, Quine. So this is a Duhem-Quine problem, which essentially says that no hypothesis is ever put to the test by itself. So for every pred prediction of a model, for every hypothesis that we're trying to falsify, uh, in every case, this is accompanied with a host of other auxiliary hypotheses in order to, ra to run an experiment and take a, a result. So a nice example of this one was a, a recent observation of galaxies lacking dark matter, which is essentially uh, a prediction of uh, the standard model. So when these results came up, uh, the first place, I, I think this, this was in 2018, a lot of the discussion that followed was about whether the distance of the galaxies was a correct distance. So it was about one of the auxiliary hypotheses for measuring the distance of the galaxies. And it was only after a couple of years that further studies were done that showed that the distance is actually correct. So we can actually talk about uh, galaxies lacking dark matter. So yes, falsification is uh, a very good epistemic standard that we have to be careful in not making this the holy grail, I think. And this is just an example of how uh, we can start uh, thinking about these methodological challenges in dark matter research. And I think I'll just echo how, how uh, well Anton has just put that. Um, I think a lot of philosophers of science in particular who are working on contemporary issues in science are very critical of some of the Popperian standards because of that. Um, and just because it is a, a nice standard, but often it's an impossible standard for some areas of science to live up to. And so what I think is really interesting and what a lot of others are focused on is, so how do you justify inferences or scientific claims 
when those types of standards aren't ever achievable, when that you can't get to that holy grail. Um, and so I think that that's the really interesting space because it leads to a lot of these issues where um, complexity of the scientific reasoning process becomes much more salient and much more relevant um, and leads to why there are such conflicts within science. So I, I think uh, Antonis just put it uh, really, really well. Giacomo, you have for anything? Yes, yes. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, well, I'm really fascinated. I didn't, well, it's really fascinating, actually. Melissa, thanks for, I didn't know that popper theories are two days. I mean, because I thought in my mind were the standard. I mean, everyone was looking at the standard, but now it's, it's nice to, to learn that this is, I mean, the discussion around that is growing, on, is growing a lot. So I, I'm complete ignorance in the, in the field. So it's really good to know. But I have a very, very, Basic question first. I have two questions. One is very basic, and, and I'm sorry again because I wanted to understand the, the terminology. I have to have a clear picture of the terminology. And in particular, I'm, I'm following the three talks uh, uh, from Antonis and Melissa and Julia. So, uh, because I understood Julia was mentioning experiment that basically simulation stands in between experiments and theory. But then, uh, and, and Melissa, you more. I, I had the, I mean, following, I, I thought you were more putting simulation versus experiments in a sense, in a, in a kind of a fight. So but while I was I was left with the, with the understanding that this basically simulation serves the, the, the theory to prove the experiment in a sense, you, I, I, from you, you I got, I, le I was left in the feeling that there is more a fight there. And finally then, uh, and Anthony has introduced something which was new to me. So it's new in this context, which is, the concept of method, uh, which I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't put in context when you when you were using the terminology method in, in this uh, in this let's say theory simulation models uh, sorry theory simulation observation and then the method so so I didn't understand the method what what do you what did you refer in that sense uh, sorry I, I opened it. <laughs> My question. Just just a brief clarification. I, I use the, the, the word method in, in, in a very general context. And by method, I mean both observations uh, and experiments. And the, the common thing in these two different uh, ways is that there are attempts to collect information about that matter. So uh, don't, don't stick to the terminology. There's nothing special about the, the word. It's just a way of putting together the different ways we can learn about that matter. Oh, okay, okay. But I think your question is is really interesting. It's something I'm actually working on right now. Um, and I'll, I'll also say that I think one of the most fun or challenging aspects to working in interdisciplinary ways is the way different disciplines use languages. And like that leads to a lot of the conflicts. What a philosopher says when they mean theory might mean something very different to an astronomer when they say theory. I mean, this led to a lot of my work in my dissertation, trying to understand what people meant when they said the Lambda CDM model. Is it a model in the sense of like a toy model or like a computer simulation or, is model being used as a stand-in for a theory? So I think there is this really interesting spectrum to explore between where is a theory uh, and when does it become something called a model? Um, are you attaching some sort of like explanatory status to theories over models? Um, or are models doing something very particular? Um, there's also within the philosophy literature, this really interesting debate between what's a model and what's a computer simulation. So at what point does it become something like a Lambda CDM model? Is that a theory? Is it um, a model that's sort of standing in for something? Is some specific specification or once you start reiterating a bunch of different instances, does it become a computer simulation? And then, uh, what the relationship between models, computer simulations, and experiments are. And some of this comes down to exactly what their use is for, um, because we often, as, as sort of I was discussing, there are cases in which computer simulations are used very much in the same way or for the same stand-in purpose as an experiment might be used in 
say biology. Um, but again, there's this area within philosophy that thinks they are very different and in terms of what kinds of claims they can make um, ultimately leads to really different things. So um, I, think, I think pointing out that there is this sort of uh, spectrum is, um, I mean, it's, it's complicated and it, behind a lot of that is some of these methodological assumptions behind that is also some of these expectations of what a scientist might expect from different kinds of things. Like you do experiments in some ways uh, to, to test the theories, or you might use computer simulations to test theories. Um, but in some ways they are, that's, this is also that theory latedness. There's this tie through a lot of it. Um, and so really trying to unpack what that spectrum looks like and what work and what sort of like epistemic work for generating knowledge claims is going on is a, is a lot of what philosophers of science are trying to understand and unpack. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, Pavel who raised his hand. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, concerning falsification, oh, I'm a little bit surprised at this moment that uh, the concept of uh, dynamical friction hasn't been raised um, because I think it's a fairly nice way to test for the existence of dark matter independent of any laboratory experiments. We just have to see whether um, Chandrasekhar dynamical friction is observed to uh, act um, on uh, galaxy pairs or satellite galaxies um, around major galaxies. And uh, the calculations which we've done so far in show that it's just not there. So one particular example, um, the large magnetic cloud is leading the small magnetic cloud and they are moving with basic, with near, next to the same velocity at near paragalactic, near paragalactic or of our, um, around our galaxy, and uh, they're moving far too fast, right? Uh, and the LMC is what about ten times more massive than the SS SMC is leading with the same velocity. They're moving in the plane of satellites. Um, this is usually as, uh, explained to be due to the first infall. But if one calculates backwards in time, this doesn't actually work because you, you one doesn't get initial conditions which are consistent with um, with the Hubble flow. So um, um, the tests which we've done and which I've seen um, rule out the existence of dark matter just by the simple uh, fact that the Chandrasekhar dynamical friction isn't isn't there. And I'm a little bit surprised that this is not uh, discussed or, you know, maybe it should be discussed a little bit more because it's a fairly fundamental deduction one then takes from the from the data i.e. dark matter doesn't exist. Thank you. We have uh, Wolfgang again and Bruno uh, with a raised hand. Okay, um, to, to take this back to the philosophy of science, as, as I said before, I find the philosophy of science discussion more interesting in this context because we really have them. So when I, when I was uh, a budding young scientist, um, the handbook that was sort of given to me was, was told me like, you know, what we as scientists are trying to do, and this is inspired by the discussion between Nicola and David, what we as scientists are trying to aspire to is try to find the rules governing reality not the rules that humans deduce that are governing reality. And I thought the way that we do this is we sort of like find theories and they're always approximations seemingly. And then as we go further, we sort of refine these. Like Newton wasn't wrong. It was just a, a well, whatever you mean by wrong. But I mean, he made a, a theory that was a very good approximation to reality. And then Einstein came along and made a better one. Um, but I thought fundamentally what we are trying to do is making something that is inhuman, not rules that are there because we're human. And I mean, no, no, maybe I, I'd like to know like you know, what I'm actually doing on my day-to-day -day job. Maybe I should know this. Can I address that? I know I've been talking a lot, but I, I just love this, this idea um, because I've noticed it myself. So yeah. Very often you see scientists express a point of view which seems to be, well, we're just advancing. Uh, Einstein's theory, it's just a generalization of Newton's theory or uh, these proposed new models of particle physics, they're just uh, extensions of the standard model. The implication seems always to be, or the, 
unstated assumption always seems to be that we've established certain things. Um, and now we're just twiddling them around the edges. Um, I sort of question that, and and I think one ought to question that. I think that um, you know quantum mechanics wasn't a, a small variation on what was there before. It was a fundamentally new thing. Einstein's theory replaced Newton's theory, even though there are some aspects um, of of Newton's theory that can be seen as asymptotic limits of Einstein's theory. A theory of supersymmetry, if it were uh, uh, adopted would be replacing the standard model of particle physics and, and so forth. There's no particular reason to think that we're, you know, getting closer and closer to the truth. I think the, the events that happened in the early 20th century could happen in the early 21st century. We could end up throwing out the existing theories of physics and cosmology completely. Um, I think it's very dangerous to assume that there's anything that we really know, and particularly when it comes to the dark matter question. Dark matter is a theoretical entity. We do not know if it exists. Um, and I think that's that's important to keep in mind. Bruno? Yeah, I, I, this, is, this was a nice intro to, to the question that I had. I mean, if you look at particle physics and they have the standard model for particle physics, now we know it's incomplete, they know it's incomplete, but it looks to me they have different discussions <clears throat> to what we have. And so I, I'm wondering what's happening that's different there. So let, let me give you the other example that I'm thinking about. The neutrino flux from the sun was always a factor of three too low. It was measured too low for all the stellar models that or the solar models that people understood. And this didn't mean that you had to throw away the nucleosynthesis in the sun. Um, it led to something that was an addition or extension or a, a new fact, new you know, new part in the, well, actually it's not included in the standard model of particle physics. So how do we go about this uh, discussion uh, if we, we always have measurements that don't fit our theories, our thinking? Uh, how do we go from having a discrepant measurement, having a supernovae too far away for the, 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 you know, the prevailing model, model at the time, um, how do we then change our ideas? And this is something that I think we should discuss more uh, rather than my model is better than your model, which I sometimes see happening. I didn't mean to shut up the discussion. I mean, <laughs> I'm not well, sure I, I guess we are, <laughs> we are reaching a time where after Three hours, I guess, sir. But, but Paula, it's, sorry if I jump in, but it's an interesting point. I was Absolutely, I'm not closing the discussion. No, I no, said only I was, that people may get too tired. No, I was wondering whether Julia, because Julia, going back to when I was listening to Bruno, I was coming back to what Julia was describing with these three different layers. And I was wondering, uh, sorry if I call it later, I mean, sorry, but I was wondering whether this is um, in line with what Bruno was saying about the, the fact that you first you know, some, uh, some observational seems to falsify, but the theory is not broken by ne necessarily. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, mm, because uh, I think that, um, in my opinion, it is easier to, um, to check uh, data and models uh, instead of uh, uh, thinking about a general theory because uh, if you focus on models then you can maybe uh, discard or uh, take something and not something else within the same uh, theory so you don't have to uh, discuss all the theory but focus mainly on one uh, one aspect and maybe this uh, makes easier to, to approach uh, the general problem if you focus on a, on a specific uh, point. And models uh, maybe are better to, to be checked against the data instead of uh, thinking about all the theory. Thank you. And, and sorry, Paula, I didn't, sorry, didn't want to. No, no, I was fine. No, no, no. I just was <laughs> considering that. Uh, 
it's uh, it's late, but not. Uh... So if I if I can add something to what Bruno said, uh, I think this is a very nice issue, and I think deviating data is what makes science interesting. At the end of the day, it would be very boring if all our science could explain everything. Uh, but I think what makes uh, a replacing model or a replacing theory particularly attractive is not only that it can accommodate the previously unexplained data, but it all, it, it, it's whether it can also explain why our previous models or our previous theories cannot actually explain this data. So I think what, what made uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity so successful is that they, they both showed how the previous theories were the limiting cases. So when we propose new models, uh, yes, it's not about which model is the best, but maybe it's also which of the proposed new models can also explain why the previous models cannot accommodate certain data. I think this is one way to, to think about this. I'll just add that I think the goal is or ought to be what's the truth. We can never attain it uh, rather than, you know, for instance, which models seem to work the best. Maybe I'll add something on, I, I saw Wolfgang post a question to David. I mean, so I think thinking about like what, what you're after in terms of truth, I'll let David answer what, what he thinks. But one of the things that I am persuaded by is some philosophers who say that scientists isn't necessarily after truth, um, but partly what we're also after is just understanding. And sometimes those things aren't necessarily this, the same thing, but I'll let David speak to his. Well, I agree completely. I, I think the distinction you're making is between uh, what I would call subjective knowledge and objective knowledge. When people talk about understanding, it always comes down to things like, you know, how do you understand this? Or um, how do you know this? Or why do you believe this? Those are all statements about things that go on in people's heads, right? Subjective knowledge. I think the more important question is objective knowledge. Things that aspects of knowledge that exist even without a knowing subject, even without a person who understands or knows them. And objective knowledge in science is always conjectural. It's always subject to being overruled, but it is a kind of knowledge nevertheless. Um, I, I don't want to define what's meant by truth, but I do think the distinction between subjective knowledge and objective knowledge is, is a critical one. And that what scientists are searching for is or ought to be uh, objective knowledge. I would think this is a very beautiful place to end the discussion, depending on what is the truth. Well, I don't know if Paula agrees <laughs> or... This is more than philosophical, right? <laughs> Yeah, okay. So I think if you agree, uh, I don't know, Paola and, and Federico, we can, if you did, we reach the, the, the 5.30 uh, time. So we can uh, conclude here. Uh, if it's okay with you, also, or unless the speakers, I don't know, uh, Julia, and, and, uh, Anthony, so uh, Melissa, or David, you want to add some concluding remarks or otherwise? We can close, okay? <laughs> I think. I mean, it's it's been it's been a long day. I, I think it was. I mean, I just to to make people aware that from YouTube there are there was a lively discussion on the chat on Zoom, uh, which is uh, which is great. But we, we could not convey pro probably all the all the discussion that was going on uh, in different um, point of view, especially specifically related to dark matter. But I, I I like to acknowledge the fact that I think. The, the core of the discussion went also beyond that matter, but more into the meaning of the truth, for example, or meaning of scientific method, philosophy. So this is all, uh, I think, a lot of food for thought, as I will, I will say. 
Uh, with this, I would like to thank everyone. I would like to thank Paula and, and, uh, and Federico for chairing the session and, and Antonis, Melissa, David, and Julia again for the great talks and the contribution. This is a lot of, for, to learn from us, from, I mean, astronomer research, getting this input from philosophy of science. So thank you very much. And with this, I would like to see you tomorrow. We will have another session tomorrow, starting at 2. Uh, the program is online or for all registered participants. We will send you the details tomorrow. As, as for today, we will send you the details uh, of the meeting. Otherwise, you can follow the, to the, the program or uh, the, yeah, the event on YouTube. Thank you very much again and see you tomorrow. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.